Today, I'm going uh, with Baptiste uh, to present you Bad Memory. It's a joint work with uh, Dan Bonnet and uh, Gustave at Stanford University. Um, so this will be uh, the last talk of the Black Hat, so we have something very special for all of you. Uh, we're going to show you a lot of cool attack. Uh, we have a very, very cool last part of the talk, so if you stay on Thursday, you will see very cool attack. Uh, usually, when uh, I look at uh, security mechanism, um, I found there is basically two main, three main ways to, to break any security mechanism. So the first one is to uh, find the design flow. Uh, for instance, we all know that web is broken because, by design. Uh, you can also try to exploit any uh, implementation vulnerability. Uh, for instance, uh, Julien this morning showed uh, 17 exploit on the kernel. And the third part, which will be the focus of this talk, is how you can try to make them irrelevant. So it might be, seems a little bit odd at the beginning, but bear with me for a second. So for a second, let's assume you get a, a nice house, like the one in the screen uh, in Wonderland. And of course, you love your house, so you don't want anyone to get inside without your permission. To enforce this kind of security, what you're going to do is put a door. And this door is your security uh, mechanism or protocol. And if a robber is smart enough, what he's going to do is not try to break through the door. He's going to try to find what we call side channel. And for instance, he might want to try to go through the windows, or he might want to try to go from the roof. And that's the basic idea we want to show you today is how to attack very well-known protocol uh, by not attacking them directly, but trying to exploit some side channel. Uh, more precisely, what we're going to demonstrate to you today is first how we can break into a uh, WPA protected Wi-Fi network. Then we're going to discuss how you can attack HTTPS uh, with cache injection. And in the third part, we're going to show you how we can steal private data from uh, social website and other sensitive information using what we call family attack. And finally, uh, we're going to discuss a little bit smartphone and show you how we can actually attack them uh, with something we call tap jacking, which is basically click jacking on steroid. So first, as a warm up, let's, say, let's start with WPA, uh, protected Wi-Fi network. And uh, so a long time ago, uh, not a long time ago, people made a huge mistake, right? It was web. And web is broken, and everyone knows that here. And of course, we move from web to WPA, which is still considered as a secure protocol. What didn't change during this transition is that uh, the secret key, which is your WPA secret key, is still stored via a web interface. And it turns out that these web interfaces are vulnerable. So we look at a lot of brands, uh, eight of them, and we try to cover the most well-known brand. And we found that all of them are vulnerable. All of these routers have basically a uh, web interface which are used to configure them and input your WPA settings, uh, your IP address, and so forth. Uh, as a result, uh, you, if you can attack this web interface, you will be able to attack the w, uh, to break inside the WPA network. Uh, there is one limitation, though, is this web interface are only accessible from the inside network and not from outside, of course. Uh, so there is two ways to attack this. The first one has been shown this morning by Craig Efner. You can do some DNS rebinding stuff. We're going to show you how to do it in another way, which is finding vulnerability into this web interface and into browser. So first, let's say, uh, let's start with the basic. Uh, how are we going to get inside the local network? Our idea is you can probably do it by having a uh, malicious page, which would be executed inside the victim browser. Uh, this is not very difficult because many advertisement companies allow you to have advertisements which have JavaScript. And they do a poor job at enforcing which kind of JavaScript you are running. So if you pay, let's say, $100, you can probably get 100,000 uh, victims to run your page. So it's a really easy to scale up this kind of attack. Uh, it's not something really new. Uh, in the beginning of 2010, Avas released its report, and as you can see, there is a lot of companies which actually are serving malicious advertisements which are trying to exploit your browser. Uh, for instance, in this graph, you might not see it, but you have MySpace. And uh, that's the basic premise of, our, of this attack is somehow the attacker is able to display you a malicious web page, and this web page will be used to attack your local network. Uh, just a quick question. How many of you uh, know what the same origin policy is? Please raise your hand. 
okay, a couple of people, a couple of people don't. So just a quick reminder for that. So the same policy, same origin policy is the security mechanism which is used by any modern browser uh, to protect one origin from another. Uh, you are browsing all the time multiple websites because you have multiple tabs or multiple windows and what you want is uh, protect one origin, let's say your bank, from evil.com as uh, we have on the screen. So the basic idea behind same origin policy is very simple. Uh, any origin can post data to another, doesn't mean it can receive an answer, it just can send data, which allow interaction between web service, but at the same time, you are not permitted to read from one origin to another. So for instance, here, evil.com is not able to read data from um, Google, Gmail, for instance. So keep that in mind, please, during the attack, and I'm going to explain you where this can come into play and why it makes our, this attack a little bit difficult. So at the beginning, uh, the attacker embeds his malicious uh, JavaScript into a web page, and this web page go inside the local network, and at that point, any firewall device are completely gone because you are inside the local network into the victim browser. So you're going to attack from inside and you are basically having access to the web interface, right? And the first step would be to try to figure out which IP address the router has. Uh, what we are doing in our implementation is we try to scan for well-known addresses, the one we shot with one and the one we shot with two, with end with one and the one we end with 254. Uh, we do about 128 uh, requests at the same time so using XSHR requests for those who want the technique behind this. And so the, the malicious page is going to scan until it found the right or the plausible IP address of the routers. Once this is done, then uh, we have to decide if the router is using a web authentication, you know, the one like you have on Facebook or Twitter or Gmail, or if, or if you use a very old mechanism which is called the basic authentication. It's a, you know, an ugly pop-up where you have username and password and you can click OK or, or not. And at that point, um, that's one of the first hurdles in this kind of attack is the same origin policy prevents us to know what, what kind of authentication the router is using because the web page, is a, the malicious code is executed into the advertisement origin whereas the router has a different origin. So we can pass data to the router but we can't actually read the answer. Fortunately for us, we were able to find, uh, to find a vulnerability uh, in Firefox which is currently uh, reported and will be patched in the next version, uh, which allows us to actually know uh, by uh, tricking the XHR request whether the router is using a, a basic authentication or a uh, web authentication. We, at, at that point, the attacker still don't know what kind of router he has to attack, and the payload we have to attack router is really dependent on the brand and the model. So what we're going to do before trying to attack it is to fingerprint it. So the way you fingerprint a router, uh, remember you can't read the data from it, so you can't read the brand and the model, you are doing two tricks. So the first one is well known, is you try to see if there is some uh, well-known images into, inside the, the router which are accessible as public, like the brand logo. And the other one which we come up with is uh, we try to see which open ports are available on the router. We are using this for a very good reason, is when you have HTTP authentication, Actually, uh, you, you, if you request an image, you will get a pop-up, and the pop-up will trigger user suspicion. So you need to do first the port scan to know, narrow down your choice, and then if you think it's safe, try to fetch the image. Um, and with this in mind, you should be able to get uh, some positive results, some negative results, and we are able with our database to fingerprint really accurately which kind of brand and which kind of model the router is. When you have that, uh, what you need to do is, of course, to authenticate to the router. So uh, there is multiple ways to do that. Uh, first, a quick question. How many of you have a default password for their home router? Raise your hand. One person, everyone changed your router default password? Really? Yes. Wow, that's impressive. Okay. Well, um, well, in this case, we have, so we can try the default password and, of course, it might not succeed specifically with a crowd like you, but we can still be able to brute force uh, the password by using what we call a timing attack. Actually, you supply the password on the web login and you read the response. The basic idea be behind timing attack is that uh, if the page is only the login and password, it's a small page, so the time it will take to load is really quick. 
If you have all the interface with all the configuration panel, it will be take longer. And this is very reliable on the local network because you are on the local network by definition. So we can use timing attack to actually differentiate. If you, get, you want to get an order, an idea of the order of time, if you are in a login page, it's usually a couple of hundreds of milliseconds. If you have a full page, it's usually one to three seconds. So it's really easy to tell apart whether you're logged in or you're not logged in. Of course, this only applies if you have a web-based uh, authentication. If you have a basic authentication, this doesn't work, and we have currently no way to test that. Another limitation is uh, since IE6 uh, SP2, you can't actually authenticate to basic authentication using Internet Explorer. So if you have a router with use basic authentication, Internet Explorer can't be used to attack it. That's uh, one of the limitations of this kind of attack. So we can brute force it, and we hopefully can get some of the router being able to, to compromise them. Uh, we also found, uh, after trying to implement all of this, that certain routers have no authentication whatsoever. So they ask you for a login and password, but if you request directly the patch you want, it actually will happily give it to you. So the improper uh, validation of the authentication, we did report that to the vendor. So we're going to authenticate to the router, and at that point, uh, we're not shut down. Actually, the, the work just start to, be, to begin because, once again, the star, same origin policy kicked off and we have to find a way to read the WPA key. We can't really read from one origin to another. Uh, fortunately for us, or unfortunately, may I say, uh, the, we found that five out of the eight brands we looked at and the router we have have XSS attack. So what we can do is we can uh, inject them. We also found that zero None, no brand had any CSRF defense, so you are completely free to try to inject whatever you want. There is no uh, CSRF token or any check on the referrer. And uh, so we were able to inject whatever we want as soon as we can find an XSS. So if there is an XSS, what will happen is the malicious page will send a payload which will uh, be used to load a uh, external JavaScript which will be used to, to do further action like this. And what, might, what happened a lot of time, for instance, in uh, this SMC example, uh, is that we found an XSS which is not on the page where we have a WPA key. But this is not an issue because you have what we call cross-contamination problem, meaning that if you have one web page which is uh, contaminated, what you can do is simply open an iframe, and the iframe by itself will open to the right page. So now we have an XSS which simply open an iframe, and we are able to read the content of this iframe because the XSS was already in the router origin. With this iframe, all we have to do is use a small piece of JavaScript and actually get the WPA key. At that point, the same origin policy became useless because, as I said, we can uh, ex exfiltrate as many data as we want as the browser don't prevent us from posting data wherever we want. Uh, so one may ask, uh, okay, sure, well, what happens if you don't find any uh, XSS? If you don't have any XSS, you can't do this trick. What about all these routers? That's a legitimate concern. Well, uh, what you can do is you can use a very recent attack demonstrated by Paul Stone in the Black Hat 2010 in Europe, which is called a drag and drop attack. So you can force a user, lure the user into drag and dropping, and it's all you to actually copy the data from one page to, to from one origin to an origin. So it's more user intensive attack, and you have to do more. Uh, uh, like a fake game where you drag a small puppet back home or you feed a uh, nice pony or wh whatever, but you can do it. It's technically possible and actually we found out that every router we look at has no, no frame busting defense. So all routers are vulnerable to click jacking. Uh, we don't make a demo, but you can also use that to reset any router you want and so forth. Uh, so, well, uh, at that point you have the key and the key go back to the hand of the uh, the attacker, and at that point you might say, well, fantastic, I have your, uh, the key of, the, of one WPA network somewhere in the world. Uh, but if you have the key and you don't have the network, you can be stuck, right? So now the challenge you are facing is, you got the key, you don't have the network. Well, there is an app for that. And uh, I think Sami Kemvoir showed it this morning as well. He, was, he found it, I think, almost at the same time as us. Uh, is there is uh, something really cool in Firefox, which is called the Look at Me protocol. So if for those who have ever seen it, no one, okay. So for those who didn't see it, uh, the Look at Me protocol is a protocol implemented by Firefox, which allow a web page to know where you are. It's 
basically meant to help uh, a web page to display you more relevant information like which coffee shop are around or which shopping mall are around and so forth. And when you request it using JavaScript, what you get is this nice uh, bar on the top. And if you click on share location, then Google will happily help Firefox know